Hey, welcome to another week of the Reformed and Charismatic podcast. I got another guest for us today coming from uh, Boulder, Colorado. So we got Chase Davis. Um, let me walk, uh, bring him on to the stage here. All right. Chase, what's up, man? How are you? Good. 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 How are you? Doing well, man. Doing well. Hey, so uh, just uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Maybe like tell us what you do, family life, married, kids. Um, sure. Yeah. My name is Chase Davis. I'm uh, married, been married for, gosh, 15 years this year. I uh, got three kids. We just had our third uh, about five months ago. Just got a baby at home. Uh, pastor at the Well Church in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we planted the well back in 2011 here. Uh, parachute church plant. Didn't know anybody here. And God has really blessed us and been gracious to us in the midst of our own uh, desire to be more mature and our own immaturity along the way. So uh, planted some churches. I'm a PhD candidate over at the Free University of Amsterdam studying um, uh, historical theology, Puritan named Thomas Hooker, New England Puritan. So uh, I do that. That takes up a lot of time. Got some other things going on, but that's I think that's the main stuff. Cool. Right on. And you, so you said you had three kids. What are, is it like uh, three boys and girls in there? Yeah, two boys and one, we just had a girl. So, uh, cool. so yeah, 10 year old, eight year old and a newborn. Cool. Yeah. I got a, a girl and then two boys. So uh, my daughter's the oldest. Nice. But yeah. Um, yeah. So you're in Boulder, Colorado and you said you're, so you are originally part of like the church planning team or were you like, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Matt, who I pastor with, it was his idea to plant. So anytime there's a problem in the church, I always go, why you wrote me into this? Uh, but no, I gladly joined up with him to plant the well church out here. Um, he always felt a particular call to start a new work for, for God, for Jesus in a new context. And so uh, we planted, we had some families, part of our core team, maybe a core team of... Uh, like 10 adults uh, that moved here uh, to Boulder back in 2011. Uh, we had been praying about it, uh, some fasting in 2010. And so, um, so yeah, that's how it kind of started. Right on, man. And um, yeah, so one of the main uh, topics that I wanted you on to discuss was an article you wrote for uh, Mere Orthodoxy called uh, Colonized by the City. Um, I read through it. I, I think I saw you post it on Twitter is where I originally saw it. Um, but um, basically it's uh, when churches, you know, they attempt to do like missions, seek the lost. Uh, they end up getting colonized by the city, right? Like they're trying to convert uh, people in the city and instead it kind of like backfires and they end up getting converted to secularism. Am I summing that up correctly? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we see this all the time with uh, with pastors who generally have a desire to reach people where they are. I uh, when we planted, I was coming off the mission field. And so I was already kind of in the mindset of a missionary uh, planting a new church. And so we were deep uh, up to our necks and kind of like the literature on missional church contextualization. And we've just seen over and over again how uh, that can go bad um, with different church planners and uh, how people can uh, seek to contextualize out of, a, out of a heart to reach people, but they end up just adopting a lot of the mantras, slogans, ideas, and beliefs of the context they're in. Um, it's easy to, easier to do in an American context and like a Muslim context. Uh, that's a bit harder to do, although you'll still see that with uh, you know, some missions movements talking about insider Muslims or, or things like that. And so, we were just, you know, we had always kind of wrestled with like how to contextualize, how to like be missional here. And so what I saw, especially in 2020, um, was just a lot of church plants capitulating on really key matters. And so that that's kind of what uh, got me writing the article. This is stuff we've been thinking about for, you know, most of our ministries is what does it look like to reach people with the good news of Jesus? And so we kind of course corrected some stuff on our end and went back to our priors and went back to the word of God to evaluate, you know, what does a more uh, faithful presence look like if you want to redeem that, that concept, that phrase, uh, and how do you do that well? Yeah. And, you know, I, I've seen this like with churches that are specifically um, more like in the urban areas. 
And um, I know you wrote about this in the article, but like, why do you think this happens more with those churches, I guess? Because I know yeah, you're in so, Boulder, which is a bigger city, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Boulder has about 130,000 people, um, around 300,000 people in the county of Boulder. The population of Boulder swells to around 150, 170 during the work week um, because so many people commute in. And so you've got the college here. You've got um, it's like the the flagship institution uh, as, as it pertains to universities in Colorado. Um, and so that takes up about a third to, of our city uh, as far as population size. So it's a college town. It's very secular. I think what happens is you're entering into a very thick culture. You're entering into a context which has already uh, adopted its own narrative, its own story about who they are and what they're about. Uh, if you were entering into a thin culture, uh, you know, it may be easier to, you know, um, to use a, a contextual model. Um, but think about planting in like a rural context in the South, for example, um, some great places down there. But if you were to go down there and you're from the Northeast and you try to plant there and you don't kind of like have any kind of relatability with those people, that's going to be very difficult because it's a thick culture. There's norms, there's customs, there's beliefs, there's narratives about who they are, their family, their their nation. And so people that go into an urban context, they underappreciate the thick culture and the, the voices that are prominent, who's being listened to, who's celebrated, who the heroes are of that culture. And they underestimate the power of that culture. And so they try to adopt, uh, kind of match and contextualize and, and uh, graft Christ onto that culture. And when you graft Christ onto a culture, it's very unwise because I think C.R. Wiley has talked about this. You're, why would you contextualize to a dying culture? Why would you, uh, Christ is Lord, Christ is risen. He's not an add-on to what the culture already celebrates. He, he actually confronts many of the things the culture celebrates. Um, and so I think in an urban context, uh, there's a, a, you could psychoanalyze the motives of church planners and why they do this. Um, we could talk about fear of man. We could talk about all that stuff. I don't know if that's fair, though. I think what's more real is just like they're trying to do a good job of reaching people. And for the sake of evangelism, which kind of becomes an idol in and of itself, what they do is they mute a lot of doctrines that they should be actually putting front and center because they're trying to reach people. And so they actually fail to disciple people. They themselves, become, the, the pulpit itself becomes discipled by culture um, because they're choosing what to say about a particular text in a certain manner in order not to offend certain gods of the city. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's good. Um, yeah, I was a part of a church in um, Stockton. So I'm here in California. And Stockton is a little more north. It's uh, it's about 40 minutes south of like Sacramento, which is like Northern California. Um, but I remember we were pretty big into like the missional, the missional. And um, we were we actually did a lot of stuff with like Acts 29. I know that's what your guys' church was a part of at one point. So we went to all their conferences up there, like in Reno, Nevada. I think it's like Living Stones was the church up there. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we might have uh, crossed paths there. We were there uh, pretty often over the course of several years. Oh, okay. Yeah. With, uh, who was his name? Like Harvey, I think it was or something, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, but so we were really big into that and we were like, our church was kind of in more of like the downtown area. Like first we were part of like an area called the Miracle Mile, which is kind of like a midtown. And then we moved to downtown, but we were doing like a lot of like art shows at the church and stuff with the kids. Cause we had a cool little like hip coffee shop right next to us. And I personally like lived above the coffee shop when I was single and like spent a lot of time down there. And I think the Lord did do some work there, but oftentimes I felt kind of like almost like compromising with them sometimes too. Right. Where it's kind of like they're doing their art and I'm there like working on my like Bible homework. Cause I was like, you know, doing my undergrad, but then I would like go outside and smoke a cigarette with them. Not that it was like bad or anything, but like, I almost felt like I had to like connect, you know, yeah. Like, hey, let's go grab a beer or something at the bar next yeah. door, you know. And we had some of them come to church, but I, I don't think any of them actually came to like real conversions, you know. Sure. Um, yeah. I think they would come because they were like cool with us, 
and we let them like use our facilities for art shows. But even then, some of the art shows had like some graphic stuff. And like looking back, it's like, why did we do that? <laughs> like, right? Yeah, you know. And I think too, they they. I mean, I don't want to speak like badly because I don't think like it's they were intentionally doing this. But I think some of the crowd got almost like pulled away too. Some of the younger guys that were getting into that scene, you know. And I know you shared in your your article where I think you guys had like a guy who would do like a what was it like a biking ministry or a biking thing or something, but they would all do like cocaine after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a bike ride that goes, uh, I think it still happens. It's a towny bike ride on Thursday nights or it was. And, uh, and so we were always trying to train people about how to be missional and like people were looking for opportunities to connect. And I look, you know, for all of my dumping on missional and, and that kind of stuff and my desire to be more like historically faithful to what the church is about there, there are some, there, there's noble intentions in some of it in terms of like just wanting to, uh, you know, love our neighbor, uh, that kind of thing. And so with that said, though, this guy was going on this, these towny rides just to meet people, make friends, hopefully have an opportunity to share the gospel. But at the end of the towny ride, they would all do drugs. And the guy came back to me and he's like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, ah, well, don't do drugs. I don't, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, I don't know if you should keep doing it or not. I mean, these people are uh, just celebrating depravity. So, uh, so yeah, that's like one example. And then you'll get examples in any college town of, you know, people going out to bars and, you know, what are they doing on Friday nights? Well, typically, you know, if you're going out to a bar and you're in college on Friday night, you're not aiming to please the Lord. Uh, you're aiming to get intoxicated. And so, you know, how do you venture into that area? Should you venture into that area? I, I kind of come from a more fundamentalist background, uh, Southern Baptist, but still pretty like strict as far as like, you can't go to those places at all. And so these are good questions to ask. Uh, but yeah, you know, you, you did see a lot of that. Like a lot of churches were doing like, you know, they would have an art gallery, a coffee shop. Um, I see this in Boulder uh, often. I've seen several Christian coffee shops started up uh, as a means of outreach, right? An outreach ministry. And so what can happen, doesn't always happen, is instead of pursuing that industry and that business with excellence, it, they view it as a ministry in and of itself, and the product suffers, and the quality suffers, uh, and they don't really see a lot of fruit. In fact, the business never becomes profitable because it's constantly having to be funded by the church or by, by supporters. And uh, so for us, we were like, well, what, is, what are we supposed to be doing? I think a lot of people, when they come to a place like Boulder, you know, it used to be, I think it still is this way. When you get people that move here from different contexts, they're like, well, how are you doing outreach? How are you serving people? You know, where's your homeless ministry? Because that's that's like an easy thing in a more urban uh, context to kind of pinpoint as a need. And so they're always looking for how they can add on ministries to the church and make the church do certain things that maybe that's not the job of the corporate body as a whole, but you can do that. Like you can go take a homeless guy out to lunch. That's totally fine. Um, you should go, you know, if you're an artist, go do excellent art. Uh, but as far as like what the job of the church is, I'm not convinced that it was prudent to marry a bunch of ancillary ministry outreaches to the church itself. Outreach is important, but I think outreach needs to be much more limited in terms of its uh, purposes and expectations if it's done as a corporate church. Um, so outreach now looks like prayer walking for us or, or something like that. Um, we've even joked like we're moving into a church building and we'll probably do this, but like going and knocking on doors. Hey, I'm Pastor Chase. I'm the pastor of a local church. Uh, would love to uh, would love for you, uh, for you to join us on Sunday. Do you worship anywhere currently? Just simple things like that, rather than trying to offer kind of like uh, B-level uh, services or expressions of culture under the guise of church ministry. Um, I just don't know if that's like you experience. I don't know if that's as fruitful or prudent, necessary, or even biblical as many people have made it out to be. Yeah. And I think a lot of that too hinges on um, <clears throat> like approaching culture as neutral, right? Like we've talked, we yeah. see a lot of this talk online now about like neutrality, but now we're in a stage where um, I would say culture is against completely against christ we're in that negative world or what they call it right yep and so i think now it's a approach of 
I mean, you have to just be flat out more of like, like I've seen more of a, like a rise in like open air preaching, you know, as a form yeah. of evangelism instead of like, Hey, you know, can we meet up for coffee kind of thing? You know? Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's, I think that's the better route now that we're seeing, you know? Um, but yeah. So the next question I had, so I found this interesting too. So you mentioned in the article that church planters, when they're planting, it's for the sake of evangelism, right? Like reaching the loss. But this kind of seems to pose a problem. Like, can you explain why? Yeah, because especially in a culture where uh, people are just godless and pagan, um, when you're seeking, when the, the church itself exists for the sake of the lost, we've misprioritized uh, to, to almost a, a, uh, a very bad, uh, we can say bad, if not sinful degree, what this what the purpose of the church is because if the main emphasis of the church is evangelism then the entire mission of your church the entire identity the ethos the culture of your church will constantly be uh you know centered around is that person going to come on sunday or is that person welcome here it's inclusion and so what I would posit differently is that the church exists for the worship of God. You know, that's we're here to worship the living God. And we're here to uh, do that together as a corporate body, as the body of Christ. And when we pitch church planting as an evangelistic ministry, uh, kind of like that's its main purpose. What you'll hear at pastors conferences is pastors, church planters get up and then complain. They'll complain. I, and it always rubbed me the wrong way, but I, I couldn't identify it until years later. They would complain about, you know, I planted this church to reach the lost, and now I've got all these Christians showing up. And I'm like, I don't know what you expected. Like, you you planted a church, and you are a pastor, and pastors care for – we are the shepherd of the sheep. Like, they are sheep, and you're you're annoyed that you have sheep. You are annoyed that you have Christians in your church. That's, like, really weird, man. If you want to go do evangelism, go do evangelism, I guess. It should be done under the authority of local elders. But yeah, when we make it all about evangelism, we're compromising left and right, our preaching, how we do ministry, uh, what we're talking about, what we're not talking about. And so it, it just becomes very confusing. And when you disciple people, Christians into a culture like that, as soon as you cross a line where they have a lost friend. And if you touch on that topic, their lost friend may not come to church anymore. Maybe they've been attending church. And if you touch on that topic, they're going to leave. Well, then we're no longer worshiping God. We're worshiping the appetites of the world. We're worshiping that person's sensibilities. And uh, man, that you want to talk about idolatry. That's that's real bad. And so that's, that's kind of why I critique it so much. I mean, it, it's often held up in church planting manuals or, or church planting prospectus. Uh, that they send out to for fundraising, like church planning is the most effective way to reach new people. That may be true. Um, sociologically, I don't know if it's still true today. E even if it were true, the purpose of a church plant isn't evangelism par evangelism. It's not just, uh, that's not the main purpose. It's to plant a church, a place to worship a people and a place to worship God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then equip the saints for the sake of evangelism. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, you know, I think we saw like a big, uh, I, I think 2020 was really revealing for a lot of this, right? Because there was churches that already, like some of the mainline denominations that were looking more and more like the world, you know, um, you saw like the rainbow flags out front and stuff. And, but some of those ones that were more um, neutral, I guess you could say is the best word, kind of like sitting on the fence, um, you saw that they got pushed to more of the left more of the like more progressive side and i think that's because they were you know more um afraid of the culture you you saw more fear of the culture than you saw fear of god um you saw more of like the partnering with like blm type stuff g joining the marches and things and and uh yeah i mean wh what is what's a good way to like i guess avoid this like for pastors and church <laughs> leadership to not be colonized by the city uh man to me, it's like, like I'm a, I'm a history, I guess, nerd, you could say. And so just going back to like what the church has always done and been about, rather than importing like modern notions of secularism, 
I mean, like you mentioned earlier, it's not whether, but which. It's not whether a culture will worship, it's which God the culture worships. And so when the city is in turmoil or outrage or parroting things, um, you know, you should be a bit suspicious. You should have a biblical, healthy biblical suspicion of what the world is preaching to you because they have their own message. They have their own gospel and they have their own story they're telling. And so I think it's kind of moving away from like, uh, believing that particularly the left has noble intentions. And if we just hear them out that, you know, we just want to give them, give everybody a fair hearing, um, you know, because what, what they often use are words like bigot, homophobe, you know, our church got slandered with uh, pro birther and Christian Taliban in the local paper. And so like, you have to be able to like know that these words have no power over you. <laughs> like you have to just be like, yeah, they they already think that about you. You don't need to. Why would you appease them? And why would why would you try to go like? I mean, you can do this personally. Like if somebody's like, I'm just all about inclusion. You can you can challenge them in an appropriate way with the good news of Jesus and the exclusivity of Christ and talking about all people are welcome. They're welcome to come and die, you know, and die to themselves and be born again in Christ. But for a lot of people, there's a lot of pressure to capitulate because of evangelism, because they're so obsessed with this revivalistic instinct and evangelicalism to reach people. And so they go, well, they're about inclusion. How can we kind of like, you know, marry that with the Bible and or equity? Let's use equity. Equity is a word in the Bible. Uh, you know, so when I was doing a, kind of my my walk back, my walk of repentance from a lot of uh, things I had believed, I just kind of implicitly kind of been taught you know uh i saw dei you know everywhere and all all my many many members of my church are dealing with dei trainings at work and so equity is part of dei or die die is a better uh, way to <laughs> arrange the letters but you know a word like equity is great because it's actually in the bible at least in an english translation and so there's a tension because you're going okay as christians we have this word and yet they're using this word, and yet they mean it very differently than God's view of justice. And unless you have that kind of instinct about you where you go, yeah, like equity, sure, but what do you mean by that? And well, here's what I mean by that as a Christian. Here's how, what God's word says about equity. Here's, here's how justice works. Here's how economics works in the Bible. And so it's an opportunity for a lot of Christians to get back to biblical truth about these topics rather than just kind of going like, well, yeah, we're about equality. And it's like, they don't mean the same thing. Like they don't. And that's what a lot of Christians fail to realize is secularism. What it does is it hollows out religion and then wears your religion around like a skin suit. It's like a zombie. And it's, it's, it'll use all the terms that, that Christians are, are, uh, you know, maybe familiar with, uh, you know, uh, equity is one example. There's other words. Um, but then they're love. Love is a great example. Well, what do you mean by love? What do you mean by love your neighbor? Um, and they're going to use it to they're going to weaponize it around you uh, against you. And then they're going to laud it uh, above City Hall with a flag and say, this is what love is. And Christians often operate as kind of dupes on these matters uh, just because they don't they don't understand the hostility against God. They don't understand that. You know, the mind of man is darkened unless God uh, enlightens and unless God uh, grants salvation. The mind of man is hostile to the ways of God. And so there's not a there's a failure to appreciate uh, the doctrine of total depravity and what that means uh, when it comes to dealing with sinners. Yeah, no, totally, man. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I would say like even in those talks of like inclusivity and stuff like that, like no one's ever truly inclusive. Like I had a seminary class where the professor was, um, he posed a issue or not an issue, a question of like, okay, so what does the Bible say about eating pizza while watching football on a Sunday or something? Everyone's like nothing. Right. He's like, exactly. They don't say the Bible doesn't say anything about um, gay marriage either. It only talks about like, like gay relationships outside of marriage. And so uh, we were kind of like, oh, that's all right. And we kind of like debated back and forth. I ended up dropping out because I got tired <laughs> of like debating with my professors. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, 
I'll plan to go back someday when I, I can find somewhere that's uh, a little more with my beliefs, but sure. on doctrine. But in that same class, um, somebody had brought up um, something about like white supremacy and if they showed up at your church. And this student, who was a little older, uh, he was like, well, I think that's the best place for them, right? To go to church. And this professor just like was just going off on him. Like, so you think it's okay for them to walk in and they're wearing their, you know, swastikas and things like that. And he was just like, oh, I, I guess not. But it's like, so you're inclusive towards like the LGBT stuff, but not towards maybe yeah. a white supremacist coming to your church. Right. Yeah. It's so, very like, critical. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, if you're gonna be no, inclusive for all, then be inclusive for all, right? But there's like yeah. those like stands that are a little more uh, bad <laughs> for everyone. Totally, yeah. There's yeah. there's a great hypocrisy, and that's what that's what I started to realize in 2020 was just the uh, stench of hypocrisy on most of these models in terms of what they were aiming for and how they applied their principles. Um, mm -hmm. the, the the common phrase is you punch right, but you caught a left, right? And so. Once I could see that, and once it's it's not like I was trying to coddle white supremacy. <laughs> it was more like, no, like they should be confronted in with the good news of Jesus, with the with the biblical text, just as we would do with anyone. Uh, and that's you know we have been that since we planted. We always called ourselves equal opportunity offenders, and we've tried to do that well. You know we've tried to, um, but if you live in a secular context, it's kind of stupid. Uh, to be dumping on sins somewhere else. You sh as a preacher, you should be paying attention to what the sins that are pervasive in the city that are, that are seeking to lead the sheep away. And those are the sins, when they come up in the text, are the ones you should actually step into um, and show the beauty of the gospel and the biblical truths uh, in the text, rather than when those sins come up. Uh, abortion is a great example in our context. Uh, I think we were one of the only churches in Boulder that when Roe v. Wade was overturned, we did a special sermon to celebrate that being overturned. And everyone else was kind of like, well, we don't, we don't want to offend people. And I was like, what are we doing? You know, what are we doing here? What's, what are we trying to accomplish uh, by not just being honest? And so there's a danger you know, for a lot of church planners and trying to like disassociate with like what the, what the lost, what the world hates about Christians. So like, it's easy for someone in a secular context to dump on white supremacy, to dump on Trump, to do that kind of stuff. But how often are you talking about the issues that actually are in your city? And that's what I always joke about with other pastors in their different contexts. And maybe this is true, but they're always complaining about these, you know, these Trump cultists. And I'm like, could I, I just would like to talk to one. Uh, I really think I, I'd like to share the gospel with them. Uh, but I don't have those. They, they, they aren't in, my context and uh you know my context is blue-haired people worshiping rocks that are confused about their gender or their sexuality uh and so th those are the topics that if we're going to be evangelistic if we're going to be missional why why would we avoid those topics those are literally like they're they're carving their bodies up they're killing babies and we're going to remain silent. That doesn't seem consistent with the prophets. That doesn't seem consistent with church history. So, yeah, that hypocrisy really irked me, really bothered me. And it's why I kind of like shifted pretty hard, pretty quick, uh, probably too fast, uh, at least publicly. But uh, thankfully, we're at a place now where our elders get it, our church gets it. And we see new people coming every week and they're, they find it refreshing. And that's the other thing, dude, is like, one thing that God has always uh, used in, in the ministry we have here, and I think he uses this all the time in a variety of churches, but one thing we've always been is we've tried to be as honest as we can about what the Bible teaches rather than like doing this kind of bait and switch. And so the loss that come to our church when they come, they actually appreciate that. Like a lot of people think you can go and evangelize or preach a message and like you should show them how, you're not what they think you are, right? The world calls us Christians, all sorts of words. It doesn't mean we have to baptize those words. And I'm not going to try to baptize the word bigot, you know, but like, I'm also not going to shirk away from the biblical truth regarding topics. And the world actually, the lost people that do come into our church, like we actually appreciate that. We appreciate that you're not, it's not that you're willing to defend you being a homophobe. 
is that you're willing to, to speak plainly on matters and what Christians have believed. Um, and we get that feedback like once a month, you know, a new person comes to church and like, this is so refreshing. It's so nice to be around people who honestly believe they're principled people who honestly believe the Bible and represent God's truth. Um, that seems more effective to me and uh, fruitful to me than doing a lot of the hand wringing over apologizing for uh, slanderous words against the church. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was at a church previously and good people, um, but I, I think a little more still on the neutral side of things. Um, like you brought up an example when Roe v. Wade got overturned, uh, there was like a slight mention of it in the sermon, but there was like the sermon wasn't about that. There was no big celebration of it. It was just kind of like, oh, by the way, you know, some prayers were answered that we've been praying for the past however many years. Cool. And everyone kind of cheered and that was it, you know? Yeah. But like the church I'm at now, like we went there, I think on like a Veterans Day or something like that, or Veterans Day weekend. And this big old like celebration of our veterans and bringing honor to those. And they had them stand up, you know, in the congregation. And it was just kind of like, okay, this is like clearly drawing like, or being like different from like the world, right? Because the world's kind of like, no, yeah. we don't like veterans. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. You know? And then um, I think there was like just mentions of like in the sermon of like, we, we, here it's men are men and women are women. There's no in between, no, not, you know, and it was just kind of like language like that. And I was like, all right, I think these are more my people. So I think we're <laughs> going to go here. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to like, people, not away. because. This is this this is the uh, the libel the uh, the accusation against guys like you. Oh, well, you're putting politics ahead of Jesus, and I hate that accusation so much because it's false. First of all, and second of all, you're not going. Aaron's not going. Like, where are my people? Although that there is a sense of that, right? We all, especially in our modern age, there's a sense of who are my people, who are my friends, who can I belong with, who's going to welcome me in. And the church has a great opportunity for that nowadays with a lot of people disenchanted with liberalism or whatever it may be. But you're ultimately going like, my people are the people of God. The people of God are the people who stand on the word of God. And I want to be with those people. Those are my people, not because it's some kind of uh, identity thing for Aaron. It's literally just like, no, like I want to go where the Bible's up upheld and esteemed and we're unashamed of it. Like that, that's what the church is about, uh, dividing the word faithfully. Um, one of the marks of a church. And so, yeah, I think I hate that libel so much because it's just, it's so stupid. And the people that say that they're often the ones actually doing what they're guilty of, putting politics out of Jesus by maintaining some kind of supposed neutral uh, preaching. And uh, that's a shame. It's a shame. And there's a lot of them out there and with a lot of power and a lot of influence peddling this lie over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not even like culturally, like my people, like I grew up like around like, cholo stuff from like my mom's side and i was like a skater you know as a kid i listened to like metal and now this new church i'm at is like dutch farmers they're dutch reformed you know <laughs> and like they have their cowboy boots and bass pro shop hats and cowboy hats you know but it's just more of like i feel like we we maybe just because like we're more like firm on like biblical stuff you know like on doctrine and stances and whatnot so yeah but yeah um i don't want to take up too much of your time but maybe in closing man like I know you guys exited Acts 29. Um, are you guys looking for like a new denomination currently or like, or have you already joined one or? Yeah. So our elders had been looking for different uh, partnerships prior to our departure from Acts 29, just seeing what was out there. So we started some good conversations with several different networks. Um, this past year, it accelerated the timeline. Um, because our belief isn't that uh, non -denom, being non-denom is inherently wrong or unbiblical. Um, it's just that uh, we believe it's better to be in fellowship with a broader communion, a broader uh, body of believers uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, prayer, uh, accountability, resourcement, training. Um, and so, um, so yeah, the two we narrowed down were the CREC, the Communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches, and the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, we're working on getting out a uh, kind of a blog for our church website, but we've already announced to our church members that we joined the SBC uh, this past fall. So we're in the SBC uh, mainly because there's, there's two primary reasons. One, there's great local fellowship opportunities here in Colorado. We have some great leaders uh, here in Colorado. There's, there's actually many Baptist church, Southern Baptist churches in Colorado, although they probably wouldn't call themselves SBC. They're here. 
but we're glad to join in fellowship with them and they've welcomed us with open arms. Um, and there's lots of resources they have. In Boulder, we've had floods and we've had wildfires and, and they have lots of things they can help provide. And when we were non denom there wasn't a lot of help outside because we weren't connected to a, a broader network or denom that could provide that assistance. They also have assistance with missions and that kind of thing. So there's just a lot of opportunity. There's also a good fight going on that we're happy to join in and the law amendment. And so we're happy to kind of throw our hat in the ring and uh, lend our sword to their aid for that cause. And so um, that's coming up this summer in Indianapolis. And so that's a really important topic in the SPC because uh, a lot of the churches that have been egalitarian or soft complementarianism have compromised the gospel. They've compromised the biblical truth on the hierarchy of the sexes, particularly in the, the office of pastor. And so, you know, we're happy to join in that fight to lend aid uh, to our friends there. Uh, the other one, Communion of Reformed Evangelical Church, is um, a smaller uh, group, uh, started in 1998. And so we, uh, we're joining, we're also joining them. We're, we're a candidate church there. Um, it has been done before, um, but that a church would join both. And so this is not, we're not breaking new ground, although we are, it, it's unique. It is unique. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't deny that, but we're happy to join with them because they've kind of had 25 years of, of, uh, really just, uh, trying to be as faithful as they can, especially on cultural matters. And then doctrinally, they're fairly eclectic. Um, I, I don't think I'm insulting the CRC in that way. I think that's, that's openly acknowledged. There's, there's different beliefs they have that are fairly unique, but they're also willing to have a, a variety of confessions welcomed into their communion. And so our church adopted the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, London Baptist. And so we are um, entering in as Baptist. We're going to be one of the few in the CREC that are Baptist. Um, there's particular policies and things you, you need to abide by when you join the CREC as a Baptist, but we, our elders are our, our consciences have been fine with that, those requirements. So we're glad to join in fellowship with those. And both, mainly the CREC, we have a lot of longstanding relationships with pastors in the CREC, and we've benefited greatly from a lot of the writing and teaching that we've seen there, whether it's Peter Lightheart, Yuri Brito, Doug Wilson. Um, and so we've been blessed to be part of it already as candidates going to local presbyteries, going to general council, and we're looking forward to that fellowship. So that one's more of like, hey, these are people that are also just – uh, wanting to honor God in liturgy, culture, worship, all that kind of stuff, uh, and, and community. And so that feels like a really good tribe. And then also the SBC, there's a lot of opportunity for resources and connection and fellowship locally, but there's also a great opportunity to uh, to see a great victory this summer. And uh, I'd like to be part of that. So those are the, the two we are, uh, we're going to be part of. Right on, man. Yeah. I didn't know uh, CRC was a, uh like welcoming to or had churches that were also uh, credo Baptist. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they have been uh, since their inception. I mean, there's, there's some nuances there and particularities they have as far as policies uh, for CREC church members coming to a ba uh, credo Baptist church. Um, and we've, we've always been happy to like, even before the CREC, we were, um, you know, the debate over, over baptism and infant baptism and then uh, communion and that kind of thing and membership. Um, you know, our church has always been very, uh, very welcoming to people from a Pado Baptist background. Um, and so we always try to pastor them on that question really diligently because, uh, you know, for a lot of Pado Baptists, we get their, they come from a Methodist background or something like that. And they wouldn't even say they were regenerate. And so as Baptists, we're like, well, you know, uh, we provide you with the option to get baptized here. Um, and, and yet, if a person were to hold a different uh, conviction, we've uh, found a way to kind of move forward with them as well. Cool. Right on. Right on. Uh, last question. I know Acts 29 was kind of more leaning um, or more kind of like trying to be a part of that, like, reformed charismatic world. And, you know, that's the name of, like, the podcast. Um, where are you at with that kind of stuff? Are you cessationist, continuationist? Great question. Yeah, I was figuring that might come up. Um, it's been something I think with it's actually a similar scheme that I equate with eschatology on this matter, because you've got all mill, pre mill, post mill are the predominant ones. I'm sure someone out there has a highly nuanced different view, but those are the big camps. Right. And with this question, you have cessationist, charismatic continuation as these kind of terms. Um, our elders have been talking a lot about this topic. 
uh, because I think early on when I was in my 20s and planted and going to seminary and all this stuff and then planting with Matt, we just kind of adopted a lot of beliefs that were held by, you know, leaders we respected. Uh, and that's what people do, by the way. That's not necessarily stupid. It, it, it's just like you look up to this person, you trust their teaching and writing. And so you kind of go like, well, I guess I'm that. And over the last few years, I've kind of been like, I've seen how, uh, you know, Driscoll exited the network. He's become more charismatic since exiting. He was always that way. He was kind of a, I mean, obviously a firebrand, but uh, always into that kind of stuff. And so I don't know that the modern scheme, my point in bringing eschatology up, I'm reticent to to adopt a particular label to describe myself. And that's not a lot of liberals who use that tactic. This is not a liberal tactic. It's more of just like, I've always been all-mill. I grew up pre-mill. Uh, I think a lot of people would consider me post-mill. Uh, if I look at church history, those words, these modern taxonomies of, of doctrine don't appear. Uh, uh, at least to my knowledge, prior to kind of like the, the enlightenment in the modern era. It's, the, it's not to mean they're not helpful or they're wrong. It's just like we, we fight a lot about that. And I think the same might be said of uh, cessationist, charismatic, continuationist. Because um, you'll get a lot of, I was just teaching on the fruits of the spirit or the gifts of the spirit a couple, a couple weeks ago in John, um, uh, John 13, 14 and on. Uh, Jesus talked about the helper and the helper is going to come and you're going to do greater works and that kind of thing. And so we try to take a historic approach to these matters, um, pulling from Calvin or Matthew Henry or Augustine or other people. And so I think most people would consider us continuationist. Um, but, you know, what's interesting is the charismatics. Um, there's certain charismatics that never seem to be satisfied. They're always going, you know, well, where, why are not we having a prophecy, Mike? And I'm like, I don't like that's just not what we're going to do here. You know, that's just not. A, and so. That's why I've been a bit more sour on the charismatic concept because I've seen a lot of those people come in uh, to churches and be great sources of division rather than unity. Um, that doesn't mean there's not certain things that I would probably believe with them, but I'm I would say I'm continuationist, but I'm I'm, I'm very curious what historic cessationism looks like. Um, there's a lot of people that dump, you know, they're very openly cessationist. And I hear them out and I've sent some videos to my elders that are from that position. Um, I'm willing to entertain that position, mainly because of the sour taste in my mouth from a lot of these charismatics who come in and cause great trouble. You know, they'll come in and accuse you of not having the spirit in your church because nobody lifted their hands in worship or, or some nonsense like this. Um, but to me, his, church history has been open to these uh, biblical realities I don't know that they've ceased. I don't I don't see that position represented well in the text, but I'm kind of like, it's not that I'm pleading the fifth, but it's I'm more curious historically how our modern taxonomy for the spiritual gifts maybe fails to account for the witness of the church throughout time. Um, and so I, that's a long answer to a simple question, but hopefully no. it provides something yeah, for you. Um, there's a book. It's a small book. I think it's called... Uh... A U charismatic, like the Eucharist, EU charismatic experience. Mm. Uh, it's like Spirit and Sacrament or something like that by Andrew Wilson. Yeah. Um, I know as a recent, not the biggest fan of like some of his stuff, but the book does sure. a really good historical deep dive into some of those early like patriarch fathers on what their beliefs were with the gifts. And this is like prior or after, you know, the apostles and stuff. Um, I also did a video with a pastor out of Lubbock, Texas. His name is Ryan Denton. His, uh, he's from Vanguard Presbyterian and yeah. uh, says he's a cessationist, but very much um, open to a lot of like the, the charismatic expressions. And uh, he, he kind of just walked through like the reformers on like, hey, they all said that like these gifts sees like if you read Calvin's commentary on the gifts, it's like these gifts sees long ago. But then you have other things where he's like, yeah, I'm still open to the gifts of apostleship because you know, Martin Luther was basically one. And then you had like John Knox who had like five prophecies that came to pass or something, you know? Sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so there's like, there's like multiple of those reformers that are very much into that. I mean, me, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty historically reformed. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm at a, currently at a Dutch reformed church, but I do have a background in some of the more charismatic churches. And I just don't see an argument for a lot of those things season, but I'm not going to be like, Hey, you know, 
the spirit's not here, you know? <laughs> like, right. Yeah. 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 For sure. <laughs> I know there's other extremes too, where you go to like the gold dust and the angel feathers and. Dude. You know, yes. So. Craziness, man. Crazy. Cool, man. Well, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Where can we uh, find you? Just on Twitter. I, I think you've written a couple of books. I think I saw too, right? Yeah, I wrote a book called Trinitarian Formation. Uh, it's uh, it was a thesis book or a thesis that I reworked into a book. It's on discipleship and taking John Frame's approach to epistemology and knowledge, um, and he kind of bases it in the Trinity and then applying that to how people grow, mature over time, sanctification. And so I wrote that book. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. J Chase Davis is my handle. Um, you can go to my blog, jchasedavis.com. You can go to our website, church website, boulderwell.org and find sermons and discipleship studies there. Um, and then I host a podcast myself called Full Proof Theology, F-U-L-L, Proof Theology, and uh, do interviews mainly over there with people that I'm trying to learn from, listen to. Uh, and, and so, yeah, that's been really fun to do as well. Cool. And if uh, anyone's listening and you're in the Boulder area and don't have a church, go to the well. Um, that's yeah, right. I'll put all the links in the description. So cool, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Have a good Thanks for having me. You too. All right. God bless.